16, verses 12 through 22. John 16, verses 12 through 22. Let's pray. Father, we come in your presence. Thankful that you have preserved your word through these centuries that have come down to us right here, right now, in State College. And we ask, Lord God, that by the power of your spirit, you would convict in our hearts that those areas of our heart that we need conviction, but also, Lord God, that you would, by the power of your spirit, work to transform and renew our minds uh, to be followers of Jesus. So, Lord God, we look to you. Uh, give us wisdom. Give us discernment. Give us guidance throughout this life. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So, a question for you this morning you want to answer for yourself. If you could know right now your entire future... Every good thing that would happen, every bad thing that would happen in your life, would you want to know? For the rest of your life, you'd know everything that was going to go on. Would you want to know that? Uh, would you want to know, for instance, if 18 months from now, your company goes through a downsizing process and you're going to lose your job? Would you want to know if 10 years from now, God forbid, your child goes down a path of drug addiction? Or would you want to know that six months from now you're going to receive an unexpected promotion and a big raise at work? How about would you want to know if 20 years from now your child is a part of a team that will discover a cure for Alzheimer's disease? Would you want to know those things? And if you did know those things, how would they affect your life right now? Today? Would you be happier? Would you be more at peace? Would you be more anxious if you knew these things were coming? Would you try to alter the future that was shown to you? Whether it's good, good things or bad things. For instance, if it's a bad thing, maybe you want to alter the future so that the bad thing doesn't occur. If it's a good thing, for instance, your child is going to be part of a scientific team that's going to discover a cure for Alzheimer's, maybe you're pushing so hard on your child in that direction that they rebel against you and that future doesn't hold. Who knows, like, if, if, if we knew those things, what, what our reaction would be. Jesus tells his followers some very, very interesting things about the future but not in a way that we would expect. And he says it's a future that will eventually bring joy to their lives. Listen to this from John chapter 16, starting at verse 12. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will speak not on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So Jesus promises his followers four things related to the Holy Spirit. First of all, he promises them that the Spirit will glorify him. The Spirit is going to glorify Jesus. The second thing is he says that the followers, his followers, will receive the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. The third thing that he says is that the Holy Spirit will guide his followers into all truth. And the fourthly, he says that the Holy Spirit will reveal to you the things that are to come. Well, let's unpack that a little bit and think about what that means for us. So the first thing he says, he says is, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is it says that the Holy Spirit will glorify him. What does that mean? that the Holy Spirit is going to glorify him. How does that occur? What does that really mean? Well, over 700 years before the coming of Christ, the prophet Isaiah, directed by the Holy Spirit, said this, Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and the earth, and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it, I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness, I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out of the prisoners, out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. Isaiah the prophet is talking about this coming 
servant of God, Jesus Christ, who's going to do these things. So right after he says this about releasing them from the dungeon, releasing them from those who sit in darkness, he says this, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, now things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So, there is a glory that belongs to God and to God alone. And it's not found in any self-help book that you might reference. It, it's, it's, it's not going to be found in uh, getting advanced degrees in the university, as good as that, that might be. It's not going to be, it's not found even in pouring your life into raising and loving your children. The glory that God can give to no other, the glory that doesn't belong to anything else, no idol, no matter how enticing it may look, no matter how shiny it may look, no matter how promising it may look, the glory that God can give to no other is to forgive your sins. And think about this for a moment. The glory of God was never shining forth more brightly than when Jesus was hanging on the cross for you and me. When he says, Father, forgive me. For they know not what they do. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He himself is experiencing separation from the Father so that you and I would never have to experience separation from the Father. So the glory of God is revealed in the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit brings us to the point in our life where we acknowledge that, yes, I am a broken sinner in need of grace that Jesus and Jesus alone offers to me and won for me on the cross. That is the glory of God that he's revealed to him that he cannot go to any other the glory of God to forgive my sin, to forgive your sin. The glory and the beauty of that gift belongs to Jesus and to Jesus alone. Secondly, he says, you will receive uh, the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. The very presence of God, the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. That's his promise to you and to me. And so he says you're going to receive power, and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, the very one who is the creator of the universe, the one who stretched out the heavens and the earth, he's going to, you're going to receive that, but you're also going to receive freedom. Freedom to do what? Freedom to actually love our neighbor. See, we're set free from a life that has been turned in on itself, which is sin. Sin is a life turned inward upon itself. To be free to actually care for and love our neighbor. This is a great time of the year when people are out of hibernation. They're coming outside again. And we have an opportunity maybe to have a, back, a, a barbecue and invite our neighbors. Most Americans, sadly, do not know the names of the neighbors of their houses that surround them immediately. I'm not going to put you on the spot on any of this. But think about that. Do you know your neighbor's names? Do you know all your neighbor's names the ones that are immediately right around you? And God placed us there and gives us the freedom to actually care for our neighbor and to love our neighbor. God doesn't need your good works, but our neighbor does. Our neighbor is placed there so we can love them and share the grace and mercy that's found in Jesus. Thirdly, is he says that the Spirit will guide you into all truth. Now the skeptics, along with Pontius Pilate, will say, what is truth? But the follower of Jesus knows truth with a capital T because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through, through me. It is Jesus where we find the, the embodiment of truth. It is not found in the latest machinations of the philosophers of our age, the scientists, the gurus of our age, but in Jesus and in Jesus alone. The Spirit works to reveal Jesus when we dig into his word that's been revealed to us and, and preserved for us over the centuries. 
And so as I encourage you to spend time each day in God's Word and meditating upon that, and the Spirit will work through that so that you can then discern what is the truth and the promises of God and say no to the false promises that the world offers around us. So say yes to the promises of God that are found in Jesus and no to the false promises, which are many. We're bombarded every single day, constantly, with, with uh, promises. If you get this, your life's going to be great. If you need this gadget in your life, otherwise you're, you're not going you're not, you're not to be cool. You're not going to have uh, anything that this life has to offer. You need all these other things. And, and the Word of God teaches us by the power of the Holy Spirit to say yes to the things of God and no to the false voices and promises of the world around us. Finally, um, the fourth thing he says, the Spirit will declare the things that are to come. What does that mean? Does it mean that a follower of Jesus will know everything that's going to come down the pike for them? Did the Apostle Paul know how many times he was going to be flogged? Did the Apostle John know that in his old age he would be uh, exiled to the Isle of Patmos? Did the Apostle Thomas know that he would eventually take the gospel as far as southern India and be martyred there? Did they know that beforehand? Well, the Bible doesn't seem to indicate that they knew in that level of detail, detail, but the Spirit reveals to us some very important things. It does reveal this, that as a follower of Jesus Christ, you will face persecution in this world. As a follower of Jesus, you will be persecuted. So there's many churches out there that will say, come and follow Jesus, and your life is going to be fantastic. Here's the thing. Follow Jesus, and the resistance of the world may ramp up even more in your life. That's the reality. I want to tell you a story. Uh, I woke up this morning, and I looked at my phone, and on our campus ministry uh, we have a group chat. And there was a message that I received this morning from a young man that attends this church uh, who's from China. And he was just baptized in this church uh, in January. And the message I received from him this morning was this, as he's back home in China now, that four churches in his local area were raided by government officials and that they were shut down. Worship was shut down. And that uh, uh, the pastors were talked to, you know, with a lot of pressure to talk to. And he said to me, he said in the message, he said that his church that he goes to, thankfully wasn't caught up in this raid, but that they worshiped in four different houses and use video technology to be able to talk to each other. Think about that when you got up and came to church this morning and what we have here and how tenuous that can really be and our brothers and sisters in Christ that are right now, at this moment, suffering on account of the gospel, suffering on account, being persecuted, for being a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, so we want to lift our brothers and sisters in Christ before God's throne of grace, that they be strong in the midst of, of this, this persecution. Uh, there is a price to pay. The Holy Spirit does reveal to us that in the last days, people will be lovers of self and not lovers of truth. The Holy Spirit also importantly reveals to us that Jesus has overcome the world and that he has overcome sin, death, and the grave for us and the devil. And because of that, though the world will dish out its worst, we in the end will stand before Jesus in his presence, having been perfectly loved and perfectly forgiven in and through him. God does not prevent us from experiencing the 
bad things of life. But here, here's the thing. If you are a follower of Jesus, the big questions of life have been answered for you. How did you get here? What is your purpose in life? What happens when you die? The big questions of life have been answered in a relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. For the non-believer, those questions aren't answered. For the believer, because those big questions of life are answered, we're not going to be uh, freed from the, the pressures and all the stuff that presses in from us from the world around us. But because the big questions of life are answered, we can have a, an assurance and a joy in the midst of that, even in the midst of those hardships. For the unbeliever, because the big questions of life aren't answered, the peripheral things that are constantly pressing in on us become the main thing. And so life is like this. Whatever's happening in our life is affected by those things, those peripheral things, because the main questions of life have not been answered. But for you as a follower of Jesus Christ, you're anchored to the sure and certain word of Jesus Christ who has overcome the grave for you because his victory is your victory. The empty tomb is your victory. The big questions of life have been answered for you. That's why Jesus can say to his disciples, a little while, you won't see me, a little while, because you will see me again, and your sorrow and your tears will turn to joy. He says, as truly, truly I say to you, you will weep and lament but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Jesus' victory over death, over sin, over the devil, gives us a life that is anchored and centered on that, and that we can have a peace and a joy in the midst of the hardships that the world brings our way. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the victory that is ours in and through Jesus. That he is the resurrection and the life. That though, though, though in this world we will experience hardships and persecutions uh, and, and unjust things, we know, Lord God, that you are with us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. That your love will never fail for, fail, fail for us but we are assured that we are adopted into your family and that we are loved with an everlasting love. So we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. So let us uh, confess our faith. Uh, stand and confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's take a moment and really just be honest before God. God already knows our hearts, but he's looking for us to confess to him our need for grace and forgiveness. That's the power of the Holy Spirit working in you to bring you to a point to confess that you need forgiveness, that Christ alone has won. So let's take a moment in silence to reflect upon our need for Jesus and his grace in our life. made known his salvation, he has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. Come, let us kneel before the Lord and make confession of our sin. 
Let us confess our sins to God our Father. 